Hey everyone, welcome into lecture number 19 of differential equations. This lecture is on discontinuous step functions. And we have actually already seen these step functions in some previous examples. We might not have called them such, but um, let's recall what they are. So recall that we have functions that we called u sub c of t. And these were defined as piecewise functions with the following formula. They're equal to 0 when t is less than c, and they're equal to 1 thereafter. So whenever t is greater than or equal to c. And so the graphs of these step functions look as follows. So if let's say our c is a positive number here, this is our y axis or our u, u sub c axis, and t is our independent variable, then the graphs of these functions look like this. They're, they're equal to 0 when t is less than c. And then at c, they take a step. That's why they're called a step function. So they take a step up to, in this case, up to a height of 1. So this is just the general u sub c function. And as c varies, uh, the, the place where the step is taken in the t direction, right? So the t value is what changes down here. So this c is a parameter for this function. And otherwise, the graph of this function will always look like this. Now, we are frequently going to want to kind of switch the roles of the 1 and the 0. And that can be done by just considering the function 1 minus c. Because if this is at a height of 1 right here, if you do 1 minus this function, 1 minus u sub c, I'm sorry, 1 minus u sub c um, will be 1 on the first portion and then 0 on the rest of it, right? So again, here's our axis. I'll just write t here. This function is going to be 1 minus u sub c of t. And so again, if our c is in the same place, then what's going to change is that this function is going to be 1 from, really, I mean, the, these can be defined anywhere. It just says uh, t less than c, so it really it keeps going, right? So it keeps going to the left. I've kind of drawn it so it stopped. On those first two, it stopped at the uh, y-axis, but that's not, that's not uh, given in the definition. So it's 1 until it reaches c, and then it steps down to zero from there on. So that's the function one minus u sub c. All right, and we're going to use these simple building block step functions to build more complicated step functions, which we'll use to then, you know, be part of our differential equations or to help try, try to solve differential equations using those. So um, here's an example. Um, I'm just going to write this function down. But if we have a function, a piecewise function given by the following formula, so it's a step, it's a piecewise function now, so it's given by 2. Uh, it's equal to 2 when t is between 0 and 4. It's going to be equal to 5 when uh, t is between 4 and 7. All right, and then it's going to be equal to negative 1 when t is between 7 and 9. And then it's going to be equal to 1 when t is greater than 9, greater than or equal to 9. All right, so let's start by sketching this function, and then we'll try to write this function as a linear combination of our u sub c's. All right, so we'll sketch it first here. And so here's what we have. Um, again, this is our y-axis. This is our t-axis. Our domain is going to have to go out to at least 9, so I'm going to put 10 little tick marks here. All right, and then um, we have some positive and some negative heights here. So I'll just do full steps here. So 2. So it's 2 from 0 to 4, right? Non-inclusive. So from 0 to 4, our height is going to be non-inclusive on the right endpoint for all of these, right? From 0 to 4, it's going to be at a height of 2 here. Then it's going to step up to 5. So 5 is way up here. So up here, it's going to step up to 5, and this was at, I should label at least the points that, uh, that we care about, right? It's going to step up to 5, and it's going to stay there until it gets to 7. So 5, 6, 7 over here. Um, so this one's going to look like uh, this portion of the graph from here to here, right? Then it's going to step all the way down to negative 1. So it's a negative 1, and it's going to stay there until it gets to 9. So this one's going to step all the way down to negative 1, solid on the left endpoint, open on the right endpoint, always, and then step up to 1, right, at 9, and stay there for the remainder. So 1, and then it goes for the remainder. 
Okay, so this is the graph of the function, and now what we might do just to help us uh, look at this, to observe this function, we might kind of add in kind of just some dotted lines. These are not part of the graph, right? Just like you would do in an algebra course, maybe, just to help you visualize that these points sit directly above one another. Obviously, the open ones are not the values of the function. The function is takes the value of the solid points. But this is the graph of our function f of t. And we now want to try to write this function as a step function, right? So um, here's how this is going to work. We're going to start at a height of 2. So I'm going to rewrite this as follows now. So f of t is starting at a height of 2. So I'm just going to write 2, all right? And then it's going to remain at 2 until we get to the t value of 4. So at, at the t value of 4, we're going to have to take a step. We're going to have to step from 2 up to this next height. So the step is happening at t equals 4. So the u sub 4 is going to be involved. And at u sub 4, that step is going to be of a height of the difference here, right? So this is a step of plus 3 units, right? It's going to go from 2 up to 5. So we're going to have a plus 3 u sub 4. All right, the next step is going to be very similar. So now we can see the step is happening at u at t equals 7. So we're going to have a u sub 7 involved. But this time, the step is stepping down, and it's stepping down by 6 units, actually, right? So minus 6 units here for this step, all right? Because we at the, at the t value of 7, we have to step down from 5 all the way down to negative 1. So this one's going to get a minus 6 u sub 7. So the u sub 7 tells us where to take the step. The minus 6 tells us to take the step down 6 units, right? And now we probably see exactly how this is going. So the last one, we're going to step up two units at 9, right? At t equals 9. So the last term in this is going to be plus 2 u sub 9 of t. And so these, this is the piecewise function way that we've learned previously, right? Of how to write down this step function. But this is now the way that we can write it in terms of our u sub c basis step functions. All right, and these are going to be useful for us. It's going to be useful for us to write it like this because now this is a linear combination of functions that we know how to take the Laplace transform of. All right, so let's recall we've done the Laplace transform of u sub c in a previous lecture, so I'm going to write it down. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, uh, maybe one more kind of more complicated, um, slightly more complicated situation which, which, we may, which may arise, but let me write this down first. But recall from a previous lecture that... The Laplace transform of these step functions, we worked this one out in, I think, the last lecture, maybe the previous one to that. Um, but the Laplace transform of u sub c, right, which is the Laplace transform of this step function right here that just takes one step, right, from 0 up to 1 at, the, at t equals c. That one is given by um, e to the minus c times s. So that's where the step happens um, over s. Okay, and this is for s greater than 0. And again, we worked this out from the definition of the Laplace transform in a previous lecture. Okay, now, um, what's the more complicated one that I was referring to a moment ago? Well, frequently, what we'll have is, is step functions where the steps are not just flat like this. They're not just constant height steps. The steps might be um, curvy or waves like a function, right, given by a function. So, for example... We could have, I'll just write example here, but this is going to be a very illustrative example. We're going to see this frequently. We may have a function g of t that's given by 0 when t is less than c, okay? But then instead of stepping up to 1, it steps up to the height of a known function, f. So f of t minus c for t greater than or equal to c, all right? And another way to write this, then, is this is given by u sub c of t, that's our step function, right, times this term. So this is where it would have normally been a 1, right? If this function, u sub c of t, would have a 1 in this spot, uh, we're replacing that by a function f of t minus c. So it's a function f that's been shifted so that its domain now coincides with the, do the shifted domain of the step function. All right, so let's look at first what the graph of this function g might look like. So to do that, obviously the function of g is going to be closely related to the function of f, the graph of the function of f. All right, so if our function f looks like this, I don't know, maybe just it's got some graph here, right? So f of t, 
and this height over here is f of 0, right? So here's our t and our y. Then g, the graph of g, if c is greater than 0, let's say c is over here, right? The graph of g is going to have the same, it's going to be 0, right? So by definition, it was 0 up until here. And then it's going to have the same height of f at c now because of the shifting. And from there on, it's going to be uh, just an uh, image of this. Um, I was trying to copy that. Probably get too much now, but that's okay. So, there we go. So this is now going to go just right here. So this, this curve just gets shifted. The same graph gets shifted over by C units. So now, this right-hand picture, this is the graph of G. So here's our T. This is now the graph of g of t. Over here, this is the graph of f of t. They are closely relate, related, right? One of them, g, is just a, a shift of the graph of f, where what happens before the shift is just the function is 0. So it's just kind of a translation, a translation of the graph of f. And in function notation, we use these step functions, these u sub c's, to do that translation or that shifting of our function. All right, now we want to know how to take the Laplace transform of this and, and what is it equal, right? So I'm going to write a theorem and then we will prove the theorem. The theorem, the proof of the theorem is just do the computation, but let me write it out as a theorem first. And this theorem, the result of this theorem is on our table of Laplace transforms, but let's write it out anyway. Well, let's say this. So if F, capital F of S equals the Laplace transform of lowercase f of t, if this exists, so, in other words, if little f has a Laplace transform for s greater than a, where a is some non-negative number, and if c is a positive constant, so c greater than zero, that's the c is going to be the shifting, right, the, the, the parameter of the shifting, then we can take the Laplace transform of this function g. So the Laplace transform of, I'll just write the formula for it, u sub c of t times f of t minus c, right? So the shifted, the shifted graph here, we can take the Laplace transform of this, and it's equal to e to the minus c times s times the Laplace transform of f itself. All right, so we already wrote down up here where f, capital F of s is the Laplace transform of little f of t. So now to prove this, all we have to do is compute this Laplace transform by using the definition. So our proof is just a computation here. So uh, the Laplace transform of this, remember the definition of the Laplace transform th is that this is the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus st times this function. So times u sub c of t, f of t minus c, dt. Now the function u sub c is uh, 0 from 0 to c, and then it's 1, right? So this whole integral can then just be replaced by the integral from c to infinity of e to the minus st f of t minus c dt. And at this point, we can do a change of variables to rewrite this integral. Remember, we know where we're headed with this, right? So we can kind of see exactly how this is going to go once we know where it's headed. But we want to make a change of variables to change the t minus c to a u, and then uh, when t is c, u will just be 0, right? So we can let, uh, whoops, wrong pen. We can let, in this case, u equal t minus c. So then t is equal to c plus u, right? And the integral becomes the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the s times c plus u times f of u, and then dt is, of course, c is a constant, so dt is just du, right? Take du, get dt, du equals dt up here. This is a linear change of variables. All right, so we're almost done because now all we have to do is notice that this e to, to the s minus sc, that portion can be factored out, right? Because um, those are both constants with respect to this integral. And so we're left with e, e to the minus so we have e to the minus sc or cs integral from 0 to infinity e to the minus st times f, uh, su, right? e to the minus su times f of u du. 
All right, and this is of course the Laplace transform of f, which we have assumed in our inter in our theorem exists. So this is then just e to the minus c s if I want it to match what I wrote here, right? Times capital F of s, and that's it. So it's just very simple change of variables. So understanding what the functions mean, and then a very simple change of variables. Okay, so the point is we can take the Laplace transform of the step functions. They're linear, right? Um, the Laplace transform is linear, so we could take the Laplace transform of something like this very easily just by using this formula. We can also take the Laplace transform of shifted function functions, right? Functions that are more curved. We can take their Laplace transforms um, just by plugging into this formula now. We don't actually have to do it every single time. We can use the table and use this formula. So um, before we do an example where we solve a differential equation, which is kind of the point here, that's where we're headed with this, obviously, Let's uh, try to find the inverse Laplace transform of a function and then sketch the function. So find the inverse Laplace transform of this function. I'll call it capital F of S equals 1 minus e to the minus 2S all over S squared. Okay, so let's try. We want to try to um, write down the function little f of t for which this function capital F is the Laplace transform. So remember how this works. There is no formula to go backwards, right? There's no formula to, to do the inverse of the Laplace transform. What we have to do is actually uh, write this out in pieces, break it up linearly, right, by linearity, break it up and then try to recognize the Laplace transforms of each piece individually. So this function is not too complicated. And we can just break this up very simply as 1 over s squared minus e to the minus 2s times, again, 1 over s squared, right? And so we can look at this and we can see that, all right, the first term, this is the Laplace transform of t. Remember, the Laplace transform of t to the n, right, of a polynomial is n factorial over s to the power n plus 1, right? So you can check this, but um, that's, that's the formula. So for this one, this is just going to be uh, t, right? One, one factorial is 1, s to the 2, so that's right. So little f of t is going to be t minus, and then this is the same This is the same function, but now it's shifted, right? So this one is shifted. So this one's going to end up being u sub 2 of t times this function shifted, shifted, right? So again, if we go back up here, it's u sub 2 of t times the normal function shifted by, by 2, by the, by the, in this case, by c, right? So instead of just t, this is going to be t minus 2 for, by the shifting property. All right, and this is good enough. We can just leave this like this as far as the function is concerned. But we would like to see the graph of this, right? So what's the graph of this going to look like? So let's sketch it. All right, um, we can, you can do this in two different ways, but for one, let's, let's just focus on from zero to two in the t direction, right? So we'll do this, we'll, we'll do this in parts. But from zero to two, the u sub two is zero. So we're just looking at the function f of t, and we know exactly how that behaves, right? That is uh, the, the identity function that looks like this, right? So that function looks just like this. It's, this is the function t. Um, from 0 to 2, it's got slope 1, goes through the origin, right? It's just standard standard identity function. Now, after that, what happens? Well, after that, this function becomes 1, and it kind of, um, you know, initializes this part of the function to, to participate, right? So after, I'll write this down here, but after t is greater than or equal to 2, right? Look what happens here. Our function f of t on this domain now equals t minus t minus 2, right? So t minus t minus 2, and look what happens. The t minus t cancels, and the minus minus 2 becomes positive. Now the function is constant. It's constant. It's equal to just 2. And so the rest of this graph is going to be like this. All right, so this is the graph of the function little f, whose Laplace transform is this right here. And so this is our function little f of t given by this formula that we got by doing the inverse Laplace transform. Remember, no good way to do, there's no formula to do the inverse Laplace transform. There is a good way to do it. You just have to break it up into parts and then very carefully um, 
try to think backwards, right? Where did where did each part of this come from? Which functions did they come from? Okay, so um, this is kind of the introduction to the step functions. Um, it's very straightforward stuff. They are, you know, just building block functions that we can use to build these, you know, functions with discontinuity. So this right here is a function with a corner. That's a discontinuity. Um, this function here that's been shifted, even though the function f looks pretty smooth, except for the part that I drew over here, uh, there's definitely a jump right here, so there's a discontinuity, and this one is obviously has a whole bunch of jump discontinuities. So these functions u sub c are going to be our building blocks for building discontinuous functions um, that we want to then use to solve differential equations, or that maybe are given to us as part of a differential equation. So to finish this lecture, what I want to do then is just solve a differential equation uh, with a discontinuous function on the right hand side and just see how it goes. So here, here's an example. We'll finish the lecture with this example, but y double prime plus 2y prime plus 2y equals h of t. Remember in the Laplace transform method we're always solving initial value problems. So the initial values are going to be y of 0 equals 0 and y prime of 0 equals 1. Alright, now this doesn't mean anything until we tell what h of t is, right? So this h of t is going to be the function that's equal to 1 when t is between pi and 2 pi. Whoops. So it's between pi and 2 pi, inclusive on the left and exclusive on the right. And then it's 0 everywhere else, but we're going to give this uh, with domains of definition as follows. So it's 0 uh, from 0 to pi, and then again from 2 pi on. Right, so greater than or equal to 2 pi. And so the graph of h is going to look kind of like a little pulse. So if here's pi and here's 2 pi, here's h, here's t, then this graph is going to look like this. It's going to jump up to here and then continue like this. So it's almost like a little pulse between pi and 2 pi. Um, Again, we can put those dots. They're not part of the graph, but it helps us see that this is like a little rectangular pulse here, and this is all happening at a height of 1. So we want to solve the differential equation for which the, our left-hand side is equal to 0 everywhere outside of this interval and equal to 1 inside of the interval. So it's going to be the homogeneous solution outside the interval, right? But then it's going to have to have this pulse on the inside. So let's, let's do it. Let's go ahead and do it. Now the first thing that we're going to need to do, we're going to use the Laplace transform method. Um, but the first thing that we're going to have to do is write our function in terms of those u sub c so that we can take the Laplace transform of it, right? So this function h, if we look at the graph, it's sometimes easier to write the function h as a linear combination of our, of our um, step functions, right? And so this one's going to be what? It's going to be 0, so we don't need anything. Remember, we had a constant for the one that started at 2. We started with a constant. This one is 0, so the height is 0 until we get to pi. So this, this one's going to be u sub pi of t, and it only takes a step of one unit, so coefficient is 1 here. We don't need to write it. And then it steps back down at 2 pi, so then minus u sub 2 pi of t. And that's it, right? So that's our function h, h of t for this problem. Now what we need to do is apply the Laplace transform to the whole, to the whole uh, initial value problem, right? So applying the Laplace transform, we get, remember the Laplace transform of y double prime is s squared times y minus s times y of 0 minus y prime of 0, right? Then we have plus 2 times, this one's going to be s times y minus y of 0, Laplace transform of y prime, plus 2 uh, times capital Y, equals the Laplace transforms of this, right? So the Laplace transforms over here are going to be e to the minus pi s over s minus e to the minus 2 pi s over s. Okay? And so um, I wrote that a little sloppily, but that's exactly what we need here. Then we plug in our initial values. So the y of zeros are going to be 0, and the y prime at 0, this one, is going to be a 1. And so now we can write out our equation and we can rearrange everything just as we did in the previous lectures when the right hand side was you know a normal function or maybe even 0. But now we have this discontinuous function on the right hand side. 
All right, so this is going to be s squared uh, plus 2s plus 2, all times capital Y. Then we have this minus 1, so I'm going to move it over. So on this side, it's going to be plus 1, right? Everything else here is gone. Everything else here, uh, the, the Y of zeros are all zeroed out. So this is going to be 1 plus uh, e to the minus pi s times 1 over s minus e to the minus 2 pi s times 1 over s. Okay, I'm writing it like this because we're going to have to treat each of these terms a little bit separately when we do the inverse, uh, the inverse um, transformation, right? And so now what we need to do is divide through by this term and uh, see what happens. So our capital Y is going to be, we're going to have a whole bunch of these terms, but Again, I want to keep you. There's a way to combine them. I don't want to combine them. I want to keep them separate so that we can do the inverse transformation uh, as effectively as possible. So e to the minus pi s times, again, I'm not going to combine these, but this one's going to be s, s squared plus 2s plus 2, uh, minus then e to the minus 2 pi s times 1 over s times s squared. plus 2s plus 2. All right, and so there's our capital Y, and now we just need to do the inverse Laplace transform of this to get our solution, right, to get our solution function. Uh, let's start with this one, because we're going to be able to kind of repeat a little bit um, some of what we have here. This is this denominator is not going to factor, right? So we can, we can complete the square. So let's kind of I'm going to color code this just so we can come back to it and see it later. I'll do this portion in magenta, and then maybe we can just, by observation, use this to help us later on because that it's going to show up. Parts of this are going to show up in, in the other ones as well, right? Um, so let's see. Um, 1 over s squared plus 2s plus 2. This does not factor, but we can complete the square. So we can write this as 1 over s plus 1 quantity squared plus 1, which I'm going to write as 1 squared. Okay? And so this one then is going to be of the form now. So I'm going to write kind of like an equal sign in quotes here. But this one's of the form of b over s minus a squared plus b squared. Because the b is a 1, right? So 1 squared goes here. <laughs> The a is going to be a negative 1, right? And so our inverse Laplace transform then tells us that the regular, the, the function little y, the portion of this is going to be little y, is going to be e to the a t times sine when it's a constant up top. Um, or Yeah, when it's a constant up top, when there's no s up top, then it's a sine, right? And if there's an s up top, then it's going to be the cosine. But this one's going to be sine. So this one's going to be e to the minus t times sine of t. And so that's what that's what happens with this one, right? Now we need to look at this term next and it's the first step of this is going to be to do the partial fraction decomposition, right? So it's going to be very similar. We're going to get the same thing for this one in, in some sense. So we're kind of doing these at the same time and then we'll consider their coefficient functions separately uh, once we get this. but. So for this one, it's going to be 1 over s times s squared plus 2s plus 2. This one's going to be rewritten then by partial fractions as a over s plus bs plus c over s squared plus 2s plus 2. All right, and so then to solve for these coefficients, we have, we've done this before, right? Uh, we're going to have, let's write this here as 1 equals a times s squared plus 2s plus 2 plus bs plus c times s. All right, so if we choose s equal to 0, then it'll zero out this side, right? So choose s equal to 0, we'll get rid of this. So then we'll have, so when s equals 0, we have 1 equals 2a. And so this means that a in this case is equal to a half. Right, so that's going to be part of our answer. And then for the rest of this, just based on our completing the square here, um, what are we going to have? Well, negative, uh, we're, we're going to have, yeah, negative 1 plus or minus i, right, is going to be, the, they're going to be the roots of this, negative 1 plus or minus i. So we can plug in then s equals negative 1 
plus i and see what happens here. So here we have a one. Negative one plus i is a root of this, if I did this correctly. So negative one plus i. Yeah, it, it's very simple, right? Because i squared is negative one, it's all good. Okay, so this one's gone, and that's the whole point. So then this becomes b uh, times negative one plus i times, that's squared, right? Plus c times negative one plus i. All right, so we work this all out. We have one equals uh, this one squared. So this is gonna be b times, I'll just work it out. So one minus two i minus one, right? Uh, plus, so then this is gonna be minus c plus c i. And so we have one equals minus c plus, this is gonna be c minus two times two uh, b times i. Right, just carefully work all this out. One minus one is zero. Um, yep, this is one squared minus two i plus i squared, which is negative one. Yep, it's all good. So this is all correct. Um, then what do we have? Well, this tells us that c must equal negative one, right? And similarly, c is equal to two b. So this means that b is equal to negative one half. And so these are our coefficients. All right, the whole point of this is now we wanna rewrite this, right? So one over s times s squared plus two s plus two. This is gonna be equal to one half times one over s. We can deal with that, right? Um, plus, then I'm gonna factor out a one half from all of this, actually a negative one half from all of this because we know how the bottom factors. So I'm gonna even write the bottom as factored out and then we'll deal with the top in a minute. But this one's gonna be then uh, one s, so s plus two. So c is gonna be two if I factor out that minus one half, right? And then the bottom here is gonna be s plus one quantity squared plus one, again, squared if we want, right? So just by the same work that we did before. All right, so just to get a little more room here, this term that shows up in both of the both of the remaining terms that we need to find the inverse Laplace transform of, it becomes one over two, one over s uh, plus, so minus right, minus a half times. I'm going to break this up now too. So this one, uh, we need an s plus one. That'll be the cosine, right? And then whatever the constant is will be the sine. So the s plus one, and then we have another plus one, right? So s plus one over. The reason I need the s plus one is so it matches this one. S plus one quantity squared plus one squared minus a half, and then there's one left over, right? S plus one squared plus one squared. All right, and so the Laplace transforms of these are gonna be, now I'll write these in a different color. Let's put them in orange. So the Laplace transform of this one is just gonna be constant one half, right? The Laplace transform of this one these are not the answers yet. We have to consider the shifting, but for now, this is gonna be minus one half uh, e to the minus t cosine of t, right? That's that one. And then this one's gonna be minus one half e to the minus t sine of t. We've already talked about that one, right? Okay, so these are the Laplace transforms of the big F, right, that we've talked about up here. So remember, if we go back to our theorem, our theorem says that e to the minus sc times the Laplace transform of big F equals, it go, if you're going backwards, right, then it becomes this, the step function that comes from the exponent in the e, and then you have to shift the functions. You have to shift the functions, uh, the t values in the functions by whatever that c is, right? So we go back to our problem. We're going to take care of each of these, right? So e to the minus pi, so e to the minus pi s times this function, one over s times s squared plus two s plus two. This one becomes u sub pi of t times all of this, right? So what's all of this? Well, one half 
uh, shifted by the t replaced by t minus pi. But there's no there's no word there's no reason to shift that right there's, there's no t here so this is still just one half. Um, the next one becomes one half and then shift it by t minus pi. So this one becomes e to the minus t minus pi times cosine of t minus pi. Right? And then same thing here, minus one half e to the minus t minus pi sine of t minus pi. And so that's how this works. So we have, this is all a product here. So this use, use of pi can be distributed to everything if we wish. Um, yeah, and we have to write down the other one now, right? Minus two pi uh, s, one over s times s squared plus two s plus two. This one becomes u sub two pi of t times same stuff, right? The one half is the same, um, minus, this one's gonna be one half e to the minus t minus two pi, cosine of t minus two pi. That's just cosine of t, right? Uh, but this is different. So then this one is gonna be minus one half e to the minus t minus two pi right t minus 2 pi sine of t minus 2 pi all right then we have to put it all back together and don't forget that we have this term up here right e to the minus t sine of t that's part of our answer right so um, at this point I'm just gonna write down our little y I'm gonna write down all the parts and then I'm gonna leave it um, but there are because of the trig functions and the nice properties of the pi and the 2 pi um, there are nice identities that you can use. So if you shift cosine by pi, you can, that becomes minus cosine, same thing here, minus sine. Um, these ones just are equal to cosine and sine. You can factor out some of these exponentials and then we can group everything together. Um, but I'm not gonna do that. You could do that if you wanted to, okay? Or if you needed to for some reason. I'm just gonna write out all the parts of this and call this one done. But so remember, don't forget this term from the, from the first term of our of our decomposition here. So e to the minus t sine of t. Right? And then add in these two these terms now. And we factored in everything except for this minus sign. Don't forget this minus sign. Okay, so this one gets a minus sign and a minus sign. So I had to go back and check, right? Always go back and check and make sure that you haven't missed anything. So plus that one's gonna be just what we wrote down. Minus, I just fixed that, but that minus sign, if we miss that, we're wrong, right? We'd be wrong. So this one is then plus u sub pi of t times one half minus one half e to the minus t minus pi cosine of t minus pi minus one half e to the minus t minus pi times sine of t minus pi and then minus u sub 2 pi of t times, and now I've run out of room, but all of this goes in here, all right? Just rewrite it, and that's it. So it's a very long solution, um, but the reason that it's so complicated, the solution, is because you're kind of, as we alluded to at the very beginning, you're finding the homogeneous solution, which is this one, right? The homogeneous solution, and then you have to factor in the solution um, in between this interval where where the right hand side is not zero it's one right and kind of stop you have to you have to do a couple things you have to stop the homogeneous solution add in this solution subtract this one out and then add back in the homogeneous solution for the rest of the interval um, you don't know you're doing that right the Laplace transform is doing all of that for you but the reason that this became so complicated at least more complicated than what we might have been used to from the previous examples is because all of that is happening in the process of the of the inverse Laplace transform right okay so but I mean it's not too bad if you just go slowly and, and keep track of everything that you're doing keep your table of Laplace transforms present as you're working on these um, then just very carefully make sure that you're not making any mistakes um, then it's not too bad. So uh, I'm going to leave this one here, but this is the general idea for solving discontinuous in, in, in initial value problems using the Laplace transform method. So I'll talk to you guys in the next one.